live TV tonight. So that's what you're watching tonight. This is the show where I take on current events. I so you're running for Congress. Yes, if, I am running if for you, Congress. <laughs> if you succeed, what are you going to do about all of this? I, I am, I'm, oh, 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 just you wait. <laughs> oh, they don't know what they're going to get when they get Lisa Michaels in out there in Washington, D.C. Sure. Just you wait. I, I am, this to me is the most important issue because of the fact everything it else underlies, spawns, it underlies, it underlies everything else. Everything, else. Yes. everything the government's doing to try to take over your liberties and your freedoms and tell you what kind of food you can eat, what kind of light bulbs you can have, what kind of car you can drive, what kind of plastic bags you can use. Everything is all justified by this. The global warming hysteria. So that means we need to get rid of the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm going to chop that right off. But but it's run by Lisa. Oh, oh, oh she's another Lisa. That's another Lisa. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to show any deference in my name. Somebody who happens to share my same name. Besides which, most, most people, most women, or most, most girls that were babies that were born around when I was born were named Lisa. There was at least three or four of us in every class. But no, um, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to, this, this is so critical and people, you guys need to understand it. That, okay, from a physicist perspective, physics, uh, uh, physicist perspective, what do you bring to the table or what do you see in this that maybe is slightly different than our meteorologist? Well, Chuck forecasts it. the weather. I look at, at physical principles. My background is very similar to James Hansen at NASA GISS. He's the primary uh, global warming guru. He's the one who has uh, promoted this for the last quarter century. He, uh, he happens to come from the University of Iowa. I come from the competing group at the University of Chicago. So we have virtually the same backgrounds, which means when we get together, we agree on quite a bit, as long as we stay away from carbon dioxide. And that's mm -hmm. the, the problem. Carbon dioxide has become the boogeyman but it's a tiny trace gas in the atmosphere, terribly important to life. We're all carbon creatures deriving all of our carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide. So it's vital to us, but it is not vital to the climate. They miss the vital gas to the climate, which is water vapor. And, but actually, if you really talk with the scientists, they understand, yes, the temperature's gone up a little bit in the 20th century. Yes, carbon dioxide has gone up uh, a little bit in the 20th century. Yes, probably some of that is due to our emissions of, of carbon dioxide. But in the end, it, you can't tie a cause and effect together. There is much more to it than, than just carbon dioxide. What they do is they, they say, okay, carbon dioxide, a doubling of carbon dioxide will cause a, a, a one degree centigrade rise in temperature. Then they say that triggers an, an effect with water vapor that uh, doubles or triples that amount. And hey, where do, where do they get that from? That's the sort of stuff that gets to be made up and that bothers, it particularly but bothers Chuck. they're actual scientists and they actually went to school and they know just like what you guys do, no, know the truth. No. See, Why, how can they do this? Here's, here's where I Do you want to still show this still slide yeah, or not? We'll, we'll, we'll go to that okay. too, uh, because uh, that, that's history lesson 1988. That was actually a climate prediction from Jim Hansen back, back in 1988. But okay, so let's the, look at this guys, slide when you get a chance. Well, these guys, though, uh, the thing that upsets me about them is they took the founding work that was done in atmospheric radiation, which we'd all studied in the 70s and 60s. It, it goes way back to when Einstein quantized radiation. We were able to make specific calculations from it. They took all the founding work and tossed it on its ear and made a false presumption that water vapor acts as a positive feedback to the climate system. And there's no evidence that it does that. And the founding work that was done years ago does not allude to that. It alludes to the fact that it's actually a negative uh, feedback to the system because there was a guy that came along uh, way back in 1917 by the name of Richard Emden who had taken a look at, at this problem and just asked himself and made some calculations. And he wanted to know what the effect of water vapor would be by itself, no CO2 at all. And so he calculated the radiation transfer with that alone and discovered that it creates its own hydrological cycle. It's, it's self-limiting and it creates enough of a hydrological cycle to where anything else obviously is going, to, uh, is going to be reacted upon by it as bringing it back to the equilibrium that it likes, which is a mean earth temperature of about 59 degrees. So you throw CO2 into the mix, and you're going to enhance the hydrological so for, cycle, for, for, not for raise the temperature. So for people that eyes are glazing over at this point, <laughs> yeah. that might be because you, you guys are so in, in immersed in this that it, it seems second nature to you. Is it like a thermostat in your house that you put it at a certain temperature and it just stays that way, but this is automatic, that the water just automatically wants to go back to right. a same it's, um, temperature, am it, I right? Well, it, it, wants to, it wants to have a, a certain amount in the atmosphere that's regulated by the Earth's gravitation and its own 
phase changes. It freezes at 32 degrees, and based upon how much is in the atmosphere, it'll, it'll condense out as cloud, and then you get a precipitation process from that. That's all governed by gravitation and the Earth hydrostatics. It has nothing to do with CO2. So it likes to have that equilibrium that can, that can only be changed by adding an external source of energy, such as something from the sun. But if you throw CO2 into the mix, you cool the troposphere just like water vapor does in exchange for the uh, greenhouse effect you get at the ground. So you're going to have a hard time growing water vapor by doing that. And that's where I think their climate codes are really messed up big time and why, we, why they just don't work. And Hansen made those assumptions himself. He never looked at the founding work, or if he did, he shelved it and tossed it aside and without but, but, ever but let's disproving get to, it. Let's get to the motive on that. You guys, if you have a question for our scientists, please do call in. It's 503-207-7135. And give us a call and, and ask uh, Dr. Folks or Chuck Weiss, meteorologist, about what, what your concerns are. If you've known this, this was a fraud all along, you've always wondered about it, or perhaps you still b buy into the, fa the idea that uh, our planet's warming. I know I said to you, when, what did I say to you when you drove in today? Oh, you said you could use some global warming because it is cold well, outside right now. I could use right some now, global but, warming. I would but, like it to be global warming, well, but, but there is you had, you had your global warming on over the weekend. Yeah. Two oh, days of record exactly. high temperatures. Oh, that was wonderful. Record highs. Was it record highs? They, no, there were two record highs. They were fill-in record highs in okay. that the adjoining days were uh, already up to that 82 or so. So we simply... Uh, uh, knocked off a couple of lower records. Lisa, but when they we did take, elsewhere in the country too. Let's we, go to this. We, can yeah. we get to the blue to the um, yeah, the slide, please? When we uh, were talking I mean, about we these climate codes, this is uh, called History Lesson 1988 because this was Jim Hansen's first climate model that he made back in the time when he first uh, rang the alarm bells to Congress about how CO2 was going to cause uh, very serious climate change and damage to the environment if we didn't do something to cut emissions. Now the the what lines. G I S S. -B? That's that's the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Those are the the, the climate model scenarios that he used. And then uh, on the bottom is the actual plot of the temperatures, the observations we've had. On the left hand side of the graph is the departure from normal uh, of the of the 30-year mean started in 1979, and across the bottom is just time. So we start from uh, 1988 when the climate model was turned on, and this is what he told Congress uh, as those lines ramp up would happen. If there was no change in the carbon emissions, yeah, like you know, right there. You, you, why don't you use yeah. that to do? So here, here's the predictions right here. He made uh, scenarios where uh, business as usual, CO2 would go up by human emissions. And then he made a, a, a forecast where there was going to be uh, drastic cuts. Uh, and that's what his model would have forecast if there's drastic cuts. And then down here at the bottom is the actual temperature change. That's what really happened. What has really happened. And you can see the, the he's it's off. Like he's so way off. off. I mean, it is so far off the mark, it's not even funny. And who is this James Hansen guy? Uh, he's, he's the physicist uh, from the uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies and NASA who and came up with this okay. idea, him and Andy Lassus. He's the Iowa guy you were just talking yes, about. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, yes, and he's the one who, who developed these model uh, modeling techniques, put his version of the physics in them, and said, this is what's going to happen if we don't cut our carbon emissions. Well, you can see how seriously and egregious uh, of an error that he made. And then what they do is they, liked, they don't like us to see these kinds of errors, so they take, they're hoping we would never reference something this far back in time. And it's like Gordon says, then as they go later in time, they say, well, we made improvements to the modeling. All they did was tweak, uh, tweak the variables as they scale it again to try to mimic what the climate actually did so that it looks more accurate than it actually is, and they make false claims about what their ability so to they, forecast they, they the So the, they, they start, start the over. timeline when, they, when, it's, when it's convenient for them, and then they end the timeline when it's convenient for them so that it looks like they're right and they can keep getting more grants and more money. I want to get to the, to the, the crux of that. Um, who's paying these people? Why it, Why are they coming up? Because this guy can't be that stupid that he can't figure out that, you know, his, his climate model is obviously incorrect, right? Well, he, he well, I notice my climate model of temperature equals a constant would work much better there. Yeah. Or, would, or one that where you put in the ocean cycles and the solar cycles would work much better and for essentially nothing because the, these models cost billions of dollars. Uh, yeah, we've spent, we've spent uh, the taxpayer has been sent a bill and has had to pay more than $100 billion oh! since, since this $100 started. $100 billion? That's, that's the total. And right now, per year, the Obama administration is spending over $4 billion a year in climate research. Oh, my 
Now, you know, this started in the 90s because it was Al Gore uh, who was like the political master of this climate business. Because mm -hmm. he wrote that book back in the early 90s yeah, as soon as the Clintons that? got it. It was called Earth in the Balance. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, there was a, a mentor of his from the Scripps Ocean Institute. Um, I'm trying to think of his name. I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, but anyway, um, Roger Revelle was the guy's name. And he was a professor from Scripps who had actually told uh, Gore at the time he wanted to release his book in 92 that um, I have some serious misgivings about my prior thoughts that CO2 could change the climate and I think you'd be ill-advised to, uh, to put your book out. He was kind of discouraging him and said you might want to reconsider this whole thing before putting that book out. But uh, Mr. Gore didn't care at that time. He had convinced, had convinced himself and uh, went ahead and released the book. And at the same time he did that, uh, Ravel and Singer came out with an article totally contradicting uh, his book that was published in Cosmos. That led to a very bitter fight between uh, Dr. Fred Singer and the uh, Clinton administration because it was a big embarrassment to Al Gore. But it was the Clinton administration that really opened up the floodgates to climate research and uh, spent all this money. And basically, it was Mr. Gore uh, saying, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I can, I'm convinced I'm right. Now and he's I'll made a fortune on this. How much oh, has yeah. he made off doing well, this? I'm not and then he's got this huge <clears throat> carbon footprint with his, his mansions and his, and his heavily gas-guzzling airplanes and, and everything <laughs> else. I mean, the, the, the hypocrisy of this and, and the... But you know what? Guess what? It's all about supply and demand. So if the supply is limited because we are not producing coal, we're not drilling, we're not uh, getting our natural gas, and we have plenty of these natural resources to run the entire country for years and years and years and years. But, so you have to stop that. You have to limit the supply. You have to stop us from drilling and mining and doing all those things. But you have to have a reason to do it. And it has to be a reason that will be global in nature and will save the planet, that will unite the planet. Besides, um, besides uh, aliens from outer space, I don't see what else they could find to unite the planet other than the weather. Because that's the only thing we all have in common, isn't that right? Or is there something else that we have in common that we could but unite the entire doing, globe? They're not doing a very good job of uniting the planet yeah. here. I think many people have realized that you can only scream uh, 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 about catastrophe so long and then people get tired of it, especially when it doesn't happen. Right. People also don't realize that there are other things going on every year that if they knew about these, they would uh, realize that this is all a hoax. For instance, uh, 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 the Earth's orbit uh, uh, is not completely circular. We get uh, a little closer to the sun in January than in July. And yet, if you look at the global temperature, it peaks uh, uh, in July. So somehow the planet is absorbing what amounts to about 80 watts per square meter of additional energy coming in in January and not even showing it in the global temperature. That's because it comes into the southern hemisphere primarily and the southern hemisphere with its vast oceans uh, readily absorbs the uh, temperature increase. It doesn't send the climate in the southern hemisphere uh, berserk, right. uh, which is what they claim that uh, carbon dioxide producing a forcing of what? Uh, a handful of watts, one, two, three watts will do it. If it doesn't do it with 80 watts every January, how is it going to do it with three watts over? Uh, on, well, uh, well, well, and this is this is the other thing that I that I, that I take exception to them too is because they call uh, they'll calculate their their numbers, their forcing numbers, like whether it's two or four watts if you doubled CO2. They they base that number, they base the number on the absorption, not what the atmosphere actually gets rid of. And when you got a water cycle like uh, water vapor, which is varying constantly, and you've got cloud you've got to take a look at all the different wavelengths that are emitting energy and getting rid of it and shedding it back to space. If you only use the absorption in, the, in an Earth type of atmosphere, you're, you're not doing the problem right. And they, they go ahead and do that anyway, and then they claim that's the answer we've got to worry about. Then they take the four watts and convert it to the Stefan Boltzmann equation to some uh, extrapolation of temperature and, and claim... <laughs>